This is lab four of ECE 480. In this lab, we'll talk about the analog to digital converters and pulse width modulation. So the MSP430 has an analog to digital converter called the ADC10. It has a 10-bit voltage resolution and 200 kilosample per second sampling rate. 10 bits means that the number of voltage steps possible is 1024, and 200 kilosamples per second means that the maximum frequency you can sample is 100 kilohertz. This is determined by the Nyquist criteria, which says that the maximum frequency, or the sample rate must be at least two times the maximum frequency of the signal that you want to capture. There are eight channels in the ADC-10 module. Two of these are internal, uh, both voltage and temperature. These can be selected based on setting a value in a register. Finally, there are internal re reference voltages of both 1.5 volts and 2.5 volts that can be used for the conversion. This block diagram shows an overview of what's going on inside the ADC-10 module. For a complete block diagram, refer to the MSP430 user's guide. On the left-hand side, we have the inputs. These can be any one of the eight inputs, either external or internal from voltage or temperature. And on the right, we have the external clock source. This can either be the A clock, the M clock, or the SM clock. On the top here are the voltage references, both positive and negative. The negative voltage reference is usually ground or zero volts, and the positive voltage reference can be anything from 1.5 volts to 2.5 volts to even the power supply voltage of 3.3 volts. So the conversion takes about 13 clock cycles to complete, and once it's done, the result is stored in the ADC-10 mem register, and then the process continues again. The next module in the MSP430 we're going to talk about is the Timer A module. This is a 16-bit counting timer, which means that it starts out at zero and counts up each clock cycle until it reaches a maximum value of 0xffff in hex, which is equal to about 64,000. There are four user-selectable modes that determine the counting pattern. These can either be counting up or counting up and then counting down, or variations on that. There are two independently programmable timers. This is useful if you have different applications where you need multiple timers. There are either two or three capture compare registers per timer. So a capture compare register will store a value that can be used to either determine the maximum value that the, that the timer will count up to, or it can be used to create a pulse with modulation output. That's actually what we'll use this timer A module for in this lab. Finally, there's a user-selectable clock that can determine the rate at which this counting takes place. So again, here's a very basic block diagram of what's going on inside the Timer A module. To find the full block diagram, refer to the user's guide of the MSP430. So again, we have a user-selectable clock. This can either be the TA clock, which is specific to the 16-bit Timer A, the A clock or the SM clock. On the right is the mode select. Now, this will select either up mode or up down mode. And finally on the bottom here is the comparison uh, blocks. So the capture compare register will store a 16-bit hexadecimal value. It'll compare that to the value that the timer is currently on and then it'll generate an output. So this is used to generate the pulse width modulation outputs that we'll use to drive the LED banks in the color organ. So let's talk a little bit about what analog to digital conversion is. So this graph shows a, a sample sine wave that is being converted from analog to digital. So an analog signal, it's continuous. It can take on a continuous spectrum of values. A digital signal, on the other hand, is discrete. It can only have a set number of values. So the bit depth, in this case 10-bit for the ADC-10 module, determines the resolution, the voltage resolution of the converter. Now that's the maximum, or actually the minimum, voltage step that any value can take on. How fast you sample is called the sampling rate, and that'll determine the maximum frequency that you can capture. 
So yeah, in this analog to digital converter, it'll convert a continuous analog signal into a discrete digital signal. And we talked about all this. The sample rate determines the maximum frequency you can resolve, and then bit depth determines resolution. So if you want a more accurate voltage, you basically have to have a higher bit depth, say 16-bit or 24-bit or even 32-bit in some examples. So here's an example of an analog to digital converter. Notice there's a typo here. This should say 2-bit, actually, because there's four values that the voltage can take on. If it was actually a 4-bit analog to digital converter, that would mean there would be 16 discrete values that the analog voltage can take on. So what's going on here is you have a sine wave, and then at every instant that the sine wave is sampled, it takes on one of, the, one of these four digital values. So I'm going to zoom out here, and we can see what the uh, resulting digital... Oh, too much. There we go. So we can see what the resulting digital signal looks like. So if you notice, we got a smooth analog signal here, and then once we convert to digital, it looks kind of blocky and not very resemblant of the original signal. So as you increase the bit depth and the sampling rate, this smooths out and it looks more and more like the analog signal. But this is just a basic example to show you what's going on in an analog to digital conversion. So if you notice at the crest of the sine wave here, when it's above this voltage level, the digital output signal takes on its maximum value. And then right here at the bottom of the sine wave, when it's below this level right here, it takes on the minimum value. And in between, it takes on a discrete number of, of steps. So this is basically how an analog to digital converter works. So the, the other concept we're going to use is pulse width modulation. So this uses a comparator and takes a reference signal in a triangle wave and uses that information to create a pulse width modulated output. So basically what this is doing is it allows you to control the duty cycle of a square wave output. So the reference signal and the triangle wave are compared. And when the reference signal is bigger than the triangle wave, the output is high. On the other hand, when the reference signal is smaller than the triangle wave, the output is low. So an important consideration is that the frequency of the reference needs to be much, much smaller than the frequency of the triangle wave. This will come into play when you're designing the digital color organ. So here's an example of pulse width modulation. We can see the triangle wave here, V triangle. And then, then we can also see the reference voltage, in this case, just a DC level. So in software, this comparator is constantly comparing these two signals and determining what the output should be. If I zoom out here, we can see the resulting digital signal, the pulse width modulated output here. So if we look at the top of the triangle wave here, when it's larger than the reference, the pulse width modulated output goes low. And then in this range right here, when the triangle wave is smaller than the reference, the output signal goes high. You could also invert this by selecting a different mode on the pulse width modulated, modulated output. The only problem would be that when the reference signal was largest, the pulse width modulated output would be smallest. If we want to light an LED, we want the pulse width modulated output to be largest when the reference is largest. So you can set that all in software. It's, it's fairly simple. So here's a block diagram of what we'll be building in lab this week. What we're going to create is a very basic single channel digital color organ. So all the four LED banks, bank one, two, three, and four, the gate drives are going to be tied together. And then that's going to be run off one single pulse with modulated output. So this won't require the use of filters. We'll add those in the, in the next lab. But it'll give you a basic idea of how to take an analog input, run it through a software program, and then control a pulse with modulated output. So the inputs to the analog to digital converter will be from lab two. This is either the microphone input or the line input, and that'll be selected with uh, that toggle switch that you installed. And then finally, lab one will use the 3.3 volt regulated voltage 
to run the MSP430 directly. So what you'll actually do in this lab is you'll take the MSP430 on the launch pad and make all the connections to your PCB from lab 1 and lab 2. So that's lab four. Uh, the concepts we're going to cover are basically analog to digital conversion and pulse width modulation. So we'll start out with a very basic example of the analog to digital converter module. Uh, what you'll be doing is measuring temperature and then converting that to a digital value, which you, which you can then display as a voltage in Fahrenheit, degrees Fahrenheit. And then finally, you'll uh, sample a sine wave continuously. This will require some modification of the analog to digital converter settings. For the timer, we'll start out with just setting a basic pulse width modulated output that you can control by inputting a number. And then you'll actually connect the two and use the analog to digital converter input to determine the pulse width modulated output duty cycle. So this is basically what a color organ does. And that's lab four of ECE 480. Thanks for watching.